This video was originally recorded July 2019 at Menlo Retreat and Dewa Spa. To learn more about Menlo Retreat, please visit their website at menlo.org. I just love to do as a good omen. Um, if you don't mind, I would be very, very grateful if you would just read a, a, any section that you like, you know, like a few paragraphs or, you know, a page or so. And, and you pick whatever you like. And don't give away the plot so that you <laughs> don't spoil the suspense for the reader. It's a very gripping work. You know? I'm going to start with the prologue. Are you sure the audio is getting her, by the way? Okay, you cut out by saying, okay, okay, just a gentle voice. Be, be vigorous. Okay. So this is the prologue to the book. Through the flow of ages and the rise and fall of cultures, a secret codex has been inscribed with the tales and stories, the rites and rituals of priestesses who are emanations of the eternal goddess, caretakers and guardians of our mother earth, Terra Gaia. In Indian China and in ancient Sumer, in ancient Greece and Egypt, in the Serengeti and the Amazon, in the Celtic wilds, there flows a timeless tradition amongst those who have walked the earth, who revere and remember the circle of life, passed from grandmother to mother, daughter to sister, auntie to niece, held safe in the heart of sisters who have incarnated through the ages. This is a text not written on pages, paper, or papyrus. Instead, it is inscribed in holograms of light, in the leaves of trees, the hum of bees, and the codes of spiral DNA. Hidden from many, the codex is known to those with the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the heart to feel that which lies just beyond the veil. It is said that the Gaia Codex contains jewel seeds, a planetary destiny for all beings in life on the planet Earth. These women, the priestesses of Estera, have sheltered and protected the Codex, and when necessary, kept it hidden and ready for those moments of extraordinary crisis and transformation when it will be needed once more for the nourishment and regeneration of all beings and all life. Okay, so hi everybody. Today we're doing a podcast with my dear friend and my admired author, Sarah Drew. And uh, we're going to talk about, I'm going to interview Sarah, and I'm so honored to have you here, Sarah. It's so nice to have you here with so me. I'm really pleased. Here. And we're here at Menla Mountain Retreat, where we've been doing some meditating about the future of the earth and about the future of our own understanding. And uh, this wonderful book she wrote called The Gaia Codex, and I hope you can see it on the, on the camera, and you can see the title. And I love this book, and um, I couldn't put it down when I first read it, and I've looked back again and again at it, and uh, it's really, it has a lot, you know, you'll love it if you, if you see it. So anyway, Sarah, so we're talking about The Gaia Codex, and you know, I love it very much because we are in a time when Thing, many things on the planet have reached a kind of really dangerous and dire point. Mm. And it could be, you know, we could be seeing the end of life, really. And we are seeing the end of life for many species and things like that. And your book is so much honestly and ruthlessly and profoundly confronts that situation and yet turns it into something brilliant and hopeful and beautiful. And it also, I think, connects with the return of the, of the female, of the feminine, as, because, as balancing the aggressive uh, greed and uh, aggression of the male. And so, um, so I'm just thrilled to have a chance to ask you about it directly and hear what your thoughts are and where you was going next, actually. If you know. But anyway, whatever you like. So why did you write this book? Can you tell us yourself what, what brought you to this uh, idea? Yeah, I think it is exactly as you're saying. Uh, really the birth of the book was a vision of this particular moment in history and time. And I sensed, as many of us had, that we were going through this portal for humanity at uh -huh. this time. 
The book was written, I started it, I got the first transmissions or downloads probably about 15 years ago. I see. I started to write it in 2008. Um, it was published in 2014. Uh -huh. And at first people, it was, you know, it was a, it's written as a fiction, but uh -huh. like I was giving a talk at Google and after I gave the talk, they go, well, why don't you just write this as nonfiction? Because it deals, as you said, with many of, of the issues that we're having at this I time. See. So when you say download, did you feel it had a sort of me? You felt you were a medium of, of Gaia herself, or who? You know, it was it, as if you something just came through you. It, you had it, that feeling. It was. It was really a book born of prayer. And uh -huh. interestingly enough, it was uh -huh. written over. I had a. I was very fortunate to have three years, not in total retreat, but where it was really meditation and prayer in writing this book, mm -hmm. um, in in a small forest retreat. Um, or at least near a forest, and it came from that place. Uh -huh. And should I just tell a little bit about the story? Yeah, Maybe please, just, sure, just, sure, just, just whatever you like. You're, yeah. you're the author, but we don't want to give it away too much. Because right. People should enjoy, have the enjoyment of the whole experience, but by all means, it'll be whatever you like. Yeah, it's it's about an ancient lineage of women that through the rise and fall of cultures have held regeneration codes for the planet. Uh -huh. And in the mythos of this lineage, when there's times of strife, environmental or uh, societal strife on the planet, these women come together and birth the world anew. Uh -huh. So it's almost like a, a bodhisattvic vow you could, that these priestesses of the star, priestesses of the star, you could almost think of it like maybe priestesses of Tara, for those of uh -huh. you that, that are into the worship of Tara, that lineage of star priestesses who are also dedicated to the earth. And... When so the, the Astera, let me just get it straight, make sure that people understand. The Astera uh, sisterhood and priesthood mm -hmm. was Greek, but at that time Greece and India were interconnected through the Persian Empire, which people don't really know. They think things just happened by themselves in Greece. Mm -hmm. But the Indian Tara mm -hmm. and Taraka and so forth and star mm -hmm. goddesses mm -hmm. probably were interconnected. Mm -hmm. And Istate, Astate in Egypt, exactly. right, isn't it? All, all and, Ishte, and so there was, seems to be in many of those cultures. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so especially I would say at the etheric level, uh -huh. there was this connection. Yes. And, and in this mythos, again, it's written as fiction. You can take it, though many readers will come and say, oh, you know, this is what I've always known to be true, but I haven't felt that I could say, you know. Uh-huh, oh, well, good. So, so really, I, you've had that experience with many readers. Ma many readers, oh, that's where there's wonderful. this reclaiming. It, in many ways, it's like a reclaiming of our lost feminine threads. I think so much of the the feminine lineage wisdom lines have been very esoteric. They've been hidden and protected, right, for good reason, because uh -huh. it's been dangerous to be out and forward at certain times. Uh -huh. And so, this is a reweaving of those. Uh huh. But to go right back to these women would they would they would uh, reincarnate in Africa or in the rainforest or all cultures. They would hold this lineage line, basically of dedication uh -huh. to Mother Earth, to Mother Gaia, whatever her name was, Pachamama, uh -huh. whatever it was. Uh -huh. That's great. And so, well, I think your own is in this lineage. So, so have you have you? Um... Do you have a sisterhood now through the book that you know about in different countries or in this country? Or yeah. how, what, is it, what, is it, what is the next step about it? Where, where are you going with it? But please tell us a little more about the story, about the young woman who's prepared by her mother for a certain apocalyptic time. Can you, can you tell a little about that? Yeah, the, the main character is a woman named Lila Sophia. And uh, Lila Lila, the divine play, and then Sophia of Wisdom. So it's the divine play of wisdom is um, okay. is the meaning of her name. Uh -huh. And she's born to two kind of mysterious parents. The father is a uh, uh, a scientist. The mother is is a priestess of Vistera, but she doesn't know of her lineage. And, and much in the kind of a heroine's journey, classic heroine's journey, she loses her parents early on the book. Uh -huh. And then she starts on her journey to, to find these women. And uh -huh. the, it takes place, I used to say it takes place a flash moment after now. I see. But given, you know, many of the times we're in where we have governments that are unstable and uh, 
governments that are taking land grabs and economic grabs as we have this increase in climate change right you know the the great waves of devastation that are coming yes it takes place next year <laughs> yes <laughs> you right. know, yeah, you know, yes, just, definitely by 2030 it seems yeah, to be taking yeah, place yes. yeah it's, if, it's, if things keep going in this negative direction yes. yeah yeah and um so it really is and to answer your question there's really a passionate following of women. We have a very large social media presence, over 150,000. Um, women um, and men are reading the book. Women uh, are joining and coming in so close to do that. I do some teaching uh -huh. around that. Um, our next steps, though, as we've discussed, is uh, we're developing a television show uh -huh. right now for this to really, oh, good. with the intent to bring this out. To a large audience, as media is medicine for this yes. time. Yes, yes, sure. And uh, for me personally, um, you know, the intent of the practice, as you know, uh, it's it's very a very tricky alchemy. I think with this to keep the vibration, the tr you know, the transmission, uh -huh. the the purity of the intent of, uh -huh. of what what it is met as medicine to do that. Uh -huh. But it's time for it to go out there. So that's that's the vision for this. Yes. As well as really having a groundswell, which many women are doing. Well, there's many sisters in many different forms. Yes, of course. And, and that's one of the, the wonderful aspects, I think, of the goddess coming at this time. She really yes. is like Mahadevi, right? She is, she is. You know, it's not one woman coming forth. It's not the great goddess in one form. It's Mahadevi in all her different aspects, yes. all her different arms. Yeah that is going forward and we're joining together as a sisterhood for the planet at this time. That's one that we need that, we totally need it. You know, when Buddha, you know, we have hope when Buddha attained enlightenment, you know that. When he attained enlightenment, the devil uh, was trying to stop him. And people know the two aspects that the devil tried. Mm. When one of them was where he tried to seduce the Buddha. He had, the, the devil in India has a lot of girls, you know, he's like a pimp actually, kind of. Mm -hmm. And so he sent a lot of dancing girls kind of thing to Buddha, and Buddha just, you know, he liked them, they were very nice, and he, but he was not attracted to them, he already was completely in a different mm -hmm. zone, you could say. And then he attacked them with the armies of goblins and trolls and mm -hmm. horrible monsters and giants and the wor something even worse than Game of Thrones, you know, like <laughs> the, 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 de the dead army, remember the zombie mm -hmm. army from the north mm -hmm. in the Game of Thrones, it was something worse than that in the, in mm -hmm. the Buddhist tale telling. And he repelled all, and all, of, the, all of their missiles and everything mm -hmm. just fell as flowers at the feet of the Buddha. So then he, his last thing was he said to the Buddha, how dare you be a Buddha? Who asked you to become a Buddha and save all beings from suffering? And he said, well, it isn't that anybody in particular asked me, he said, but for millions of lifetimes I have mm -hmm. um, done everything I could for beings. Mm -hmm. And then the, they looked like, the devil looked skeptical, and then the Buddha said, well, for example, in your case, you were the head devil, king <laughs> of the devils, because you were altruistic a little bit once mm -hmm. when you were torturing somebody in hell mm -hmm. and your fellow torturer was tired and you took his mm -hmm. shift. And you, so you did a little altruistic thing, and by that, by the seed of that positive act, mm -hmm. you became king of the devil. So I did millions of those positive acts in millions and billions and trillions of lifetimes. So now I don't really need to be asked by beings, but mm -hmm. I have already the goodwill of all beings, and they want to be helped, mm -hmm. and I have the ability to do it, so I'm going to be Buddha. And then the devil said, well, he's so clever, he said, well, you are my witness that I did that one thing back in those many lifetimes ago when I was torturing some people in hell. But who could possibly be your witness of all these huge numbers of things that you did? And the Buddha said, Mother Earth is my witness. Mm -hmm. So he called on Mother Gaia, and then that famous gesture where he puts one hand down, he touches mm -hmm. the Earth. Mm -hmm. And then Mother Earth comes out halfway out of the Earth, not completely, that's the upper body. Mm -hmm. Because her lower body is the earth, you know, so she comes out of the earth, and then all kinds of other Mother Earth, you know, you know, 16 of them in, mm -hmm. in some of the forms, or mm -hmm. 32 of them also come, mm -hmm. and they all start reciting simultaneously, like multimedia show. Mm -hmm. They recite to the devil their witnessing of the Buddha's having given his life in this life, given his blood in that life, given his mm -hmm. limbs in another life, mm -hmm. given his family away, given his country away. You know, and, and on every level, acts of giving, acts of mm -hmm. self-sacrifice, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, you know, he had done so many of them. So it's the Mother Earth who kind of guarantees mm -hmm. the possibility of a Buddhahood, of, mm -hmm. of becoming totally benevolent being. And when Buddha becomes a being, it's not just that one being has become benevolent, that, that gives the promise that all beings can become benevolent beings and will do so, actually. At least the way the Buddhists understand it, you know. And people who have had the Buddhist education, whether they're religiously Buddhist mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, you know, I think it's very timely that you come at it because I think that I personally am very involved in the climate change thing mentally. Mm -hmm. I'm a really lazy ivory tower type of person, mm -hmm. and I just retired, you know, from my academic teaching. But I and I feel there's nothing more important I can do in my declining years than for my grandchildren, and great grandchildren, and so on. But but get the shift in time, this climate change thing and help the people who have been scientists, who have seen it and said it, and really make everyone understand that the doubt that people feel mm -hmm. is part of the dark money, sort of mm -hmm. dark movement mm -hmm. against their interests mm -hmm. in order to make more money for the dark money. And governments do it, and people do it, and, and corporations do it, you know. So we have, to, we have to approach that on every level. We can't just say, all the wealthy people are bad, you know, because some of them have oil stocks. We, you know, some are, and some, but many want to be, want, want to change this themselves, and many of them do love their children and do want to see the earth mm. flourish, you know. Mm. So we have to approach it on that level. The women have to come out in, a, in the way they are doing, beginning to do. I think we're mm. seeing that, mm. but uh, they're being pushed back really hard too. You know, the pushback is very, very hard, as you say, but they have to do it. You know, we really need them. I think if all the women, for example, voted in the next election, mm. without exception, no matter how many vote disenfranchisement, you know, the, the climate deniers, I don't call them Republicans because I don't consider them genuine Republicans, but the climate deniers, you know, that they do, uh, they were still only overwhelmed, I think, by the number of women, uh, if they all really get clear on, and they become inspired by Gaia, and they realize their mm. own kind of Earth mission, let's mm. say. And that's why I love your book, Dada, because it really shows this Earth, Earth mission. You know? It's really great. Gaia Codex, you know. Mm -hmm. So now what are you doing? So you're making a movie now, right? Yeah. And this is going to be a what? Netflix type of thing or HBO multi, multi session? Right, we're developing. How many? Eight sessions? Yeah, eight, eight episodes okay. as a start. As well, a eight movie. episodes in the first season. In the first season, right. <laughs> <laughs> See how it evolves. Um, I just wanted to say something also just to what, to what you're saying, you know, it, it really, you think about it, everyone wants clean water for yes. themselves and for their children. They have to every, have every, everyone wants fresh air yes. for themselves and their children and their grandchildren. Yes. If, if, not, if not for your children and your grandchildren, at least you want it for yourself, right? Yes, if, exactly, if, exactly. If, you know, everyone wants fresh food. You know, everyone, maybe everyone doesn't love trees. I love trees, yeah. you know, but it's all part everyone of our, loves trees. right? You know, it's, it's, if we can take it down to these very simple things and, you know, as the Dalai Lama says, you know, even if these people who are against climate change or, you know, if they can just do it in their self-interest, right? Yeah. If, if simply for that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, actually, in f pretty much, Everybody who of any level of education and authority, including the owners of all the oil companies, they know that it's happening and they knew it first because they studied the climate and they, mm -hmm. they studied their, their, their science, they hire scientists themselves. <coughs> and many of them are scientists and graduates of MIT and things like that. So they know that. The, the, the bad thing, the evil thing is the greed for money and, and influence and power and confusion of ideology is that they they want they want the masses to doubt it so that they can keep selling. They know that they know that there will never be a shift to renewable energy one way or another. But they just want to delay that as long as possible to make as much money as possible. And meanwhile, money can't buy back, uh, uh, you know, Miami. Forest. It can't buy back a flooded Florida. It cannot. Or the forest, you know, and, and it's. It's such short term, and this is part of, you know, in the Gaia Codex, you have a culture through the priests of Esther, and, and other cultures have been like this, yes. where there's long view. You're understanding that a, a soul transmigrates through multiple lifetimes, yes. right? 
and a comic effect and causality. Yes. One of the things I love in here is that the women, there's something called the 64 arts, which are based on the 64 arts that you find in many tantric yeah. traditions and stuff. But they study these arts over lifetimes, right? Yeah. And, and they, they accrue that wisdom and there's a training of that. And so it's a model for just not these short-term gains yeah. that, that are so much the, what much of our society, not all of it, of course, is based on. Yeah. But it's, it's looking at how our seeds are like in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, you, how, how is our effects of our actions going to right. right. emanate and sure. resonate over time? Yes, yes, yes. And and that, that, well, that's one of my things. I want people to realize that they, are, in one way or another, they're going to be here. Yeah. When the planet is wrecked, no matter how many billions they may make out of selling oil at this time or coal, that they're going to be here and they're going to have to eat the coal dust yeah. or the pollution themselves in some form, which will be a much less glorious form than they currently ex experience. Yeah. So, you know, that there was that wonderful op-ed of Michelle Alexander, the lady mm -hmm. who did the new Jim Crow book, mm -hmm. wonderful sociologist lady, about mm -hmm. how she said she didn't even believe in a future life. Mm. But she wished that everyone did mm. for themselves, in other words. And, you know, whatever you call their future life, whether they're reborn as a, as a tree or a bush or a person or mm. whatever the energy of their embodiment becomes, in some way they're going to be connected to the world. You know? yeah. The idea that by getting to be so powerful and so wealthy mm. that they can somehow disconnect from the consequences of everything is the one view that we really have to overcome. Because in other words, they can't. No, none of us can afford despair and passivity mm -hmm. in the face of a situation where we will remain connected to the negative consequences of however we behave. Yeah, so that, that 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 your book shows that in its own way, mm -hmm. not in a Buddhist in particular way, and in a very mystical and marvelous way, and it totally shows that. And also, one thing I love about it, the, this priesthood of the Astartes, is it shows the power of their mind. Mm. their creativity and their vision mm. and I think that is really wonderful mm. and, and uh, people don't have enough self-confidence in their creativity and so they just think somehow they can only consume things you know they don't realize that by creating pleasure they they they, they get more pleasure really I, like I, I often think when you know someone's buying a $3,500 handbag or something or something some bauble that looks pretty however expensive it is it really is we're just they're trying to reflect the beautiful jewel body that we are. Right? Uh, yes, yes, they're, they're trying to to have something that reminds them of of this magnificent thing that we are as Homo sapiens, yes. as, as evolving Homo sapiens, as 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 Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the making, even if it's over multiple lifetimes. Yeah. You know, it's and it, we're supposed to take care of the other animals, you know, and help them and not yeah. extinguish them, you know, like we're doing. You know? Yeah. So anyway, so thank you so much. Yeah, it's, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And it's so nice. And I'm so glad you're on our podcast. And uh, you. you must come again also. And, uh, and um, we must have a, we, you know, we'll see when, uh, I'm looking forward to the film, I must, absolutely must say. And I must say, you know, I am so fond, of course, of my granddaughter, Maya. The cover picture, just I want to say for Maya fans, Looks just like my eye, actually. It does. I, I didn't remember that from having read the book until I saw this copy again. But it looks just like her, you know, she's, who's nowadays in Stranger Things. Mm -hmm. But this is, a, this is an even stranger <laughs> and more beautiful thing. And I would love it if it would, I, I'll have her apply to the casting director when you're ready. I will. I'll, I'll encourage her to. I can't have her do anything. But they do what they want. But I'll encourage her to do so. I really will. I think she's been perfect. She's, it's amazing the coma of her looking just like the heroine there. Yeah. And what's her name? The name of the heroine? Lila Sophia. Lila Sophia. The divine play of wisdom. Sanskrit yeah. and then. Lila Sophia. Sophia. Yeah, Lila has the idea of playfulness, joyfulness, and Sophia wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful, really wonderful. Okay, well, thank you very much. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. Thanks for watching. Tashi Dilek.